Well, <clears throat> it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me say that uh, Greg Foltz was probably uh, one of the most remarkable young physicians I ever met. You heard about his dramatic career decision of uh, uh, a concert pianist to uh, physician dedicated to glioblastoma. I remember Greg when he was uh, second or third year resident at the UW in neurosurgery. He came over and said, look, he wanted to understand leading edge biology and how that could be uh, applied to brain cancer. And he immediately took to uh, transcriptional analysis of tumors and things like that. Very, very new at that time. And uh, over a period of years, he did absolutely a spectacular job. He got recruited away to Iowa, set up uh, a wonderful program there, and then uh, later came back here to Swedish to carry out the kind of program that you've talked to. And, and, and Greg really foresaw and began to practice personalized medicine before it came uh, anywhere near as uh, popular as it is. So I think Greg is a remarkable individual. And what is really terrific is this institution is uh, his memory. So we all have to do better. What I'm going to do is, is give you some general views of approaches that I think are going to be useful for brain cancer uh, in the future. And in doing so, we'll try and give you some sense of just exactly what uh, systems biology is all about. And when I started at Caltech as a young assistant professor in 1970, I remember being uh, challenged both uh, in thinking about biology and about disease by the enormous complexity. And it very much reminded me of the fable of the elephant and the six blind men, each feeling a different part of the elephant and declaring uh, it's a stump, it's a fan, uh, it's a spear. And of course, if the elephant represents a complex biological system, what you'd really like to do to begin describing it is integrate together those observations in a way that made sense. But what you also realize is that you have to think about brand new ways of making many, many more measurements before you can ever understand the elephant. And that's kind of where we were in uh, 1970 or so. The techniques of molecular biology then were just utterly inadequate to the task of uh, complexity. And I had the really good fortune of uh, being involved in a whole series of paradigm changes over the length of my career that ultimately have led to this new way of thinking about medicine, P4 medicine, and, and ultimately to uh, creating an avenue for bringing P4 medicine to the healthcare system. And we'll talk about each of those things in the course of the lecture. But the paradigm changes were uh, bringing engineering to biology. We developed throughout my career a series of six instruments. And they, they were really about reading and writing uh, DNA. And what this led to is high throughput biology. And that, of course, opened the door for big data and biology. And we'll hear more and more about that again. Now, the development of the automated DNA sequencer got me invited to the first meeting ever held on the Human Genome Project. And, and it was an enormously interesting meeting in the spring of 1985 at Santa Cruz. And 12 experts that had been invited to come and decide whether it was a good or bad idea to do the Human Genome Project. And, and, and we came to two conclusions. One, it could be done, although it was, at that time, technically difficult. And two, we were split six to six on whether it was a good idea or not. And in fact, when I went out into the community uh, in the, over the next five years, initially, I would say 80% of the biologists were really against the Human Genome Project. And, and the fundamental argument used was big science is bad science that's going to take away resources from small science. And the irony is, of course, the uh, ROI, the, uh, 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 the investment that's come from the Human Genome Project is, has been estimated to be around $800 billion. 
for a cost of $3 billion. So that's a pretty good ratio. And there's nothing that has ever enabled small science more than the Human Genome Project has. And we're all familiar with that now. What it did is it gave us a complete parts list of all the genes and, by inference, all the proteins. So we could really, for the first time, start to think about systems biology. And, and the third paradigm change was the realization in the course of developing the automated sequencer that we needed to put together engineering, chemistry, computer science, and molecular biology to really uh, uh, achieve this goal. And that gave me the idea of uh, developing uh, a cross-disciplinary environment in biology where leading edge biology could drive a complementary types of technologies and then uh, the corresponding development of analytic tools. And I tried to persuade Caltech to do this, and the biologists were absolutely against it. You might, uh, you might realize why that is. But Bill Gates made it possible to come to the University of Washington and set up this first cross-disciplinary department. And I'll just say, for eight years, it was really revolutionary, and it absolutely um, developed seminal technologies that contributed to the Human Genome Project and to the then newly emerging fields of, uh, of proteomics. And what creating that cross-disciplinary uh, platform made me realize is that we had to build on top of that uh, the vision of systems biology. And that's where uh, the bureaucracy of a large state university really gets in the way of truly new ideas. And for that reason, I ended up resigning in 2000 and starting the Institute for Systems Biology. And that really pioneered uh, system science. And we'll show you some examples of just what that is. And of course, we very early on began applying systems thinking to disease. And that led to the concept of systems medicine. Uh, and then we began thinking not just about what were the tools we needed to do modern medicine, but what should be the characteristics uh, for the patient, for the healthcare system, and came up with the idea it should be predictive and preventive and personalized and uh, participatory. And of course, uh, as we'll see in just a moment, one of the real questions was, how could we really bring that to the healthcare system? And this recent affiliation that's just about a week old now between ISB and Providence is going to let us bring some, I think, really seminal uh, transformational uh, uh, translational pillars to, uh, to uh, the healthcare system at Providence. And we'll talk about those uh, at a later time. So systems medicine really has two central features that you have to understand. Humans are exactly like the elephant. So the question is, what are all the kinds of ways that we can make measurements with a human being? And what we've pioneered is this idea of generating dense data clouds with billions of data points, dynamical data clouds, because we look at the individual across time every three months or so, and of course, personalized data clouds, because we are looking at each individual separately and gathering many different types of data. And what this is, is essentially a platform that's going to let us revolutionize the two fundamental features of healthcare: wellness on the one hand and disease on the other hand. And that's what we'll talk about in this uh, seminar. Uh, the second point is the systems thinking really is mechanistic in the sense that it realizes biological networks are the key information conduits for development, physiology, aging, and the like. And when disease perturbed, they alter the information generated. And of course, if you can understand the nature of that alteration, you gain fundamental insights into disease mechanisms, and you get new approaches to uh, early diagnostics and therapy as well. And I'll, again, show you some examples of that uh, at a later point in time. So what uh, the state of the art in about uh, 2006 or so is we'd totally articulated this vision of, of systems and P4 medicine. And the key question was, 
what did we need to do to really be able to take it to the healthcare system? And it was exactly like the elephant. We knew all sorts of things that we wanted to do to be able to make uh, the dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds. But it was utterly clear federal funding agencies weren't interested in the slightest in this kind of thinking. So what, we had the, what I had the good fortune of doing was meeting in 2007, the uh, um, minister of uh, finance for the state of Luxembourg, who at that time had decided he wanted to transform Luxembourg's community from one 90% dependent on financial services uh, and bring in healthcare and biotechnology. So he asked us to put forward a, a strategic partnership where we did lots of things for Luxembourg, and we won't talk about those. But what they did for us is they gave us 100 million over five years to develop these new systems-driven technologies and strategies for, uh, for medicine. And these put us at an incredible tipping point. And what was really important about this money is it wasn't the nickels and dimes you get from federal funding. And it wasn't, we almost in every case did high risk, high gain kinds of projects, the types you'd never again get funded at NIH. And we'll, I'll show you a whole series of, of what we did in this regard. So in 2013, at the end of that, we were really in a position to say, OK, how can we embody the essence of systems or P4 medicine in a project that we could bring to people? And we first proposed a project to carry out a longitudinal, high-dimensional data study of 100,000 well people. And it was interesting, in 2014, I went to Francis Collins at NIH and proposed, this is going to be a terrific new approach to healthcare. And we, I'd asked him if we could just get the resource to do 100 people as a proof of principle. Collins had no interest whatsoever in this approach. And I'll tell you, this approach has gone on to be what I think the essence of the precision uh, medicine initiative should be all about. And we'll talk about that in some detail. So the technologies that we developed had to do with aspects of sequencing and new kinds of antibody-like reagents and single cell analyses. And I'll just, I'll just talk about two of these uh, technologies. So one, we're now beginning a collaboration with a company that looks like by the end of 2017, we'll have the ability to sequence genomes for $200 a genome. And I'll argue with that, we can make genome sequences a fundamental part of every individual's record as they come into the, yeah, the healthcare system. And it will give you tremendous insights in how to deal with that uh, individual as, as a unique kind of individual. And the peptide protein capture agents we'll talk more about. We developed a series of strategies, uh, family, the sequencing, complete DNA sequencing of families lets you get disease genes. I'm not going to talk about that. But I am going to talk about being able to follow disease progression from the beginning to the end in, in orthologous model organisms. Because if you think about human disease, you can't tell me one disease maybe apart from some small skin things, that you can follow from the beginning to the end in a human being. But you can follow it from the beginning to the end in animals. And when you do, you learn fascinating things about network dynamics. And I'll show you uh, a couple of examples of that. We're going to show you how we took blood and transformed it into a window of distinguishing health from disease. And then we'll talk about these dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds and so forth. And uh, later, you'll he hear from Nitin Baliga about some really elegant and powerful computational techniques for beginning to uh, identify uh, drug targets for uh, cancer, for glioblastoma in this particular case. So let me just start by talking about a model we initiated many, many years ago of uh, prion-induced neurodegeneration in mice. 
where you could compare the experimental animals and their control litter mates across the 22-week period duration of this disease. And what we did was to take the, analyze the brain transcriptomes at 10 different time points across that, that uh, time read. And what we did is we subtracted the normal transcriptome from the experimental animal's transcriptome. And to our horror, we found that there were about a third of the mouse genes that um, varied differentially expressed genes. And of course, what this said is there were enormous signal to noise problems. And I'll just say you that there are two kinds of noise in uh, dealing with humans. One is the noise that comes from the technologies that you use to make measurements. And that kind of noise is pretty easy to deal with. But the second is the noise that comes from biologies that are irrelevant to the disease process you're interested in. And the key there is how do you subtract those irrelevant biologies away? And I'm not going to go into detail. I'll say we constructed six special inbred prion strains of mice. And we were able to subtract away all but 300 differentially expressed genes. And we felt these were right in the core of this neurodegenerative response. We did uh, immunopathology following the brains across the 22-week period and identified four major processes that were going on. Uh, prion replication and accumulation, glial activation of an immune response, uh, and, and several different forms of uh, nerve cell uh, death and so forth. And the first remarkable observation that we were able to make is as we looked across that 22-week period, each of those four major uh, uh, disease-perturbed networks cut in at a different point in time. The first was the network most uniquely defining the process, and then glial activation, and then the two forms of neurodegeneration. Now, why is knowing what the first networks are really important? It's important because once we understand those, we can identify molecules that are likely to be the earliest signals of the disease transfer. And we can begin to study the network for diseases that can perturb its behavior. And of course, one of the things that if you were uh, really intrigued with this, you might ask, well, how are we ever going to do this in humans? Do we have to take brain biopsies every 10 weeks across the? And of course, that doesn't work. but. Another technique that we uh, ended up developing, which I'll show you in just a moment, really came out of looking at the diverse networks and how they changed across time. And I'll just say that 200 of the 300 genes we'd identified fell into those four major networks we talked about. And the other 100 defined six additional networks that at the time no one had any idea were involved in this disease process. And collectively, if you looked at the dynamics of each of those 10 networks, they explain virtually every aspect of the pathophysiology of the disease. So one of the things we went to is a really interesting idea that we could identify transcripts that were unique to the organ we were interested in. And we identified probably three or 400 brain-specific transcripts. And we were able to use mass spectrometry to show that at least 100 of these, and that's in both mouse and in human, uh, actually encoded proteins that ended up appearing in the brain, uh, in the blood and that we can detect with mass spectrometry. And the importance of that, of course, is what you'll see with those 100 proteins is in a normal individual, the levels will be set at one series of stages. But if a disease comes up, the networks that become disease perturbed will alter uh, the concentrations of their cognate proteins. And you'll get a fingerprint for the kind of change that is unique for each different type of disease. So what we were actually able to do is identify 15 brain-specific proteins in the mouse 
that mapped into those four major networks there. And we were able to show in the blood that we could detect the first changes almost as soon as we detected the changes in the transcriptional networks in the brain. So this makes blood a window for being able to follow the progression of a disease and even to begin uh, knowing when it is initiated. And that's a point we'll return to at a later time. We've done exactly the same for really well-engineered mouse models of glioblastoma. These are done by Terry Van Dyke at NCI. And uh, basically what she did was to take the cancer atlas data, which showed that there were four major uh, networks that were operating here. And she took three genes, uh, a, a tumor, two tumor suppressors and a, one uh, oncogene. And she engineered them into mice in a combinatorial way. And she did it in such a manner that she could turn on those genes whenever she wanted. So you could have animals with the modified combinatorial genes placed in them, let them go all through development. And then as mature animals, you could turn on the disease process. And you knew exactly what t equaled 0 in the disease process. So let me just say that the uh, fourth little network over here uh, was one that she didn't take an oncogene from. And the P53 oncogene is one uh, we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But um, so, let's, so we found, in this case, 18 disease-perturbed networks. And again, explained a lot of the pathophysiology of the disease. But let me show you, we put together, she put together, again, these oncogenes, uh, tumor suppressors in a combinatorial manner. And what she could do is create mice that had successively higher grades of disease. And the pathophysiology and the histology and the transcriptional networks mimicked in an incredible way their human counterparts. So we think these are really good uh, models for disease. And we analyzed in some detail the third of the diseases there, which in many ways were the most classic ones. And here is a, a depiction of the networks that we see. So the, uh, the uh, triangular shaped things uh, uh, are uh, microRNAs, and the circles are uh, levels of transcripts. So you can see at two weeks, you've had a bunch of changes. At eight weeks, you have a bunch more changes. And at 16 weeks, really a lot of changes in one interrelated EGFR, HLA network, and so forth. And the importance of those dynamics, and I could give you a lot of detail, but the real importance is we can go back to the uh, 10 cardinal features of cancer, and we can now place them all in a time period during the progression of the disease. So we can map just when various aspects of that occur. And each of them have different implications, obviously, for the uh, pathophysiology at that stage. So uh, really quite a remarkable observation that confirms, once again, those networks really describe most of the pathophysiology that we, we do see in the disease. And the other thing that was really interesting is P53 uh, we, we didn't alter it in any way, yet in one set of mice, we saw enormous numbers of p53 mutations. And virtually every one of the diverse mutations we saw had that mutation represented in the human material. And, and the only question I'd leave you with is what are the nature of the selective forces that could allow you in a mouse to so powerfully repredict the spectrum of human disease? And that's a question we really uh, haven't answered at this point in time. Now, we've also looked at human disease from a dynamical point of view, uh, glioblastoma. And this was a really interesting study, a collaboration uh, with uh, a fellow at the Chang Chung Memorial Hospital, where he had uh, a series of 10 patients that had either three or four 
successive glioblastomas. He had removed each of the glioblastomas from each of those patients. And then we determined the complete genome sequence of the germline for the 10 individuals and all of the different tumors for the 10 individuals. And this is an enormously long paper that we're just in the midst of finishing up. But uh, I mean, we can look in a great way at evolutionary profiles. We actually had these patients treated in different ways. You can see how drugs modified uh, the shape of their mutational patterns. You can begin to think about new ways to identify the genes that are really driving the process. And I'd say, if you look at most tumors at just one point in time, you won't have a chance for really knowing what's a driver and what's an irrelevant mutation. You need dynamics to be able to sort that out. And GMB shares uh, really interesting features with other tumor brain disease. In, in fact, the activation of the glial uh, 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 innate immune system is a, a common feature that's fantastically interesting. And, and they, what these studies also showed is there are fundamentally at least two different mechanisms for gen generating mutations in these humans. And I'll show you that in this slide. So uh, patient three, their mutations were essentially single nucleotide mutations. And they're represented by all the many lines you can see on that outer circle. Whereas patient four, most of the variants that really make a difference are structural variations of deletions or insertions and or uh, chromosomal translocations. And so here's the first tumor from both patients. Here's the second tumor from both patients. You see an increased number of the, the, uh, the variants of the two different types. And here's the third tumor from the other patient. So you can see the dynamics of this process, and it's relatively stable for each of the individuals. If you look at the other eight individuals, you see that there is some kind of combination of the two mechanisms operating. But here, we have a chance of really going after what this kind of fundamental mechanism is. How about making blood a window into health and disease? And let me tell you that there have been a lot of biomarker studies in this classic IOM analysis in 2012 came to the conclusion of the hundreds of science nature cell papers out there. There were only a couple that produced drugs that went on to be in the clinic. And they asked the question, why exactly was that? And there were two answers. One is that when you look at a normal and a cancer patient in their blood, you see enormous differences. And 99 plus percent of those are noise. So you have to know how to get rid of the noise. So that's one point. And the second is, if you study biomarkers in one population and get really good sensitivity and specificity, if later you go to another population, it might not work at all. So the genetic variability of human populations mandate, mandates when you create biomarkers, you have to look at multiple geographically diverse populations to make sure you're correcting for uh, genetic polymorphisms. And that's what we did uh, in a study that was carried out at a company we started about five years ago, Integrated Diagnostics. At was done with Paul Kearney there and Nathan Price at uh, ISP. And, and basically, what we did here was to recognize the fact that there are 3 million cases annually in the US of a spot in the lung. And the question, is it neoplastic or is it not? And of course, what was interesting about that whole thing is that Probably 600,000 of those 3 million went on to surgery. And way more than 50% of those that went on to various forms of surgery for analysis of that spot in the lung turned out to be benign. So it's an enormous waste of resources, morbidity. So what we wanted to do was to set up an assay which could distinguish benign nodules from their neoplastic counterparts. So what we did was 
We use systems approaches, and I won't go into that, to identify almost 400 proteins we thought might be relevant to uh, this kind of diagnostic assay. And most of them were supposed to have been expressed in the blood, although we could only detect about half of them there, roughly uh, 200 or so. So what we did then was to analyze the blood of 72 individuals that were known to have a benign nodule and 72 that had a neoplastic nodule. And we did this from four different sites. And what we did was to score each of those 144 tumors against these 90 proteins. And then we took 30 of the proteins, or 32 of the proteins, that had the best scores in that analysis. And what we did was to do a combinatorial computational uh, uh, slot machine kind of calculation where we identified a million panels of 10 proteins, uh, making all the combinations of the 32 there. And we asked, of those 32 proteins, and then we, we took the million panels and we scored them against the 144, half benign, half neoplastic. And we took then the top sets and said, which proteins were the most cooperative in the sense they were found most frequently in those higher score uh, panels? And we were actually then able to get a panel of 13 proteins. And we carried out a validation study. And the validation study was even better than the, uh, the discovery study. And uh, the company commercialized this in the fourth quarter of 2013. It's been an incredibly effective test. But the most important point is, and I don't have time to tell you, those 13 proteins gave us ideas about how we can make the test much, much simpler. And now we have a two protein panel test that is better than the 13 protein panel test was before. And I won't go into all the details, but to say the reason that's exciting for us is with those two proteins, we'll make ELISA assays, and you'll be able to take a fingerprint drop of blood and be able to carry out the analyses. So uh, what does this do for us? So with the 13 proteins, we were able to actually uh, rule out surgery for more than 40% of the benign nodules with very high specificity. And that prevented more than a third of the unnecessary surgeries. And that alone saved the healthcare system $3.5 billion a year. And that's why the payers were really attracted to this, uh, this assay. And it obviously has improved the quality of healthcare. But the really interesting point is, we haven't talked about it in detail, but we did an enormous filtering to get down to 13 proteins. So what you might ask is, what do these 13 proteins do all la lung cancer? And frankly, they map into three of the major disease perturbed networks in small cell lung cancer. So this is the set we'll be able to use, one, to look at the earliest stages of initiation, and two, uh, to follow through with progression, as we talked about uh, the neurodegenerative disease. Now, I'm going to tell you about peptide protein capture agents that I think in 10 to 15 years will totally replace monoclonal antibodies. And these are essentially uh, the invention of a, a, a terrific chemist at Caltech, Jim Heath, and we've collaborated in uh, and created a company, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But the basic idea is he created a library of 10 to the 7th D-amino acid fivemers, circular fivemers. And what he showed is you could take any protein you needed capture agents against, and you could identify low affinity binding monomers. And with a chemistry called click chemistry, we could put together in the proper three-dimensional orientation, pairs or even triplets of those things to make dimeric or trimeric specific protein capture agents. A dimeric protein capture agent capture agents had nanomole, low nanomole activity, as good as many of the best monoclonals. And if you did a, a triplet, you could get down into uh, picomole. Uh, sensitivity. And then what Jim did was really brilliant. He showed basically how you could focus 
the production of these protein capture agents on a single peptide, and there were some rules you had to follow. But if you did that, you created protein capture agents that virtually eliminated the cross-reactivity of you see so commonly with monoclonal antibodies. So you could have highly specific reagents. And more recently, we've demonstrated that these uh, peptide reagents can be incredible as drugs, as well as as diagnostic reagents. And we're, we have a big collaboration with Merck looking at uh, PD-1 and interesting related kinds of molecules. And I won't go into that. But, but the idea is these are rock stable. So we can put them in an envelope, send them to Africa. The affinity won't have changed at all. These are incredibly sensitive. And we can make them as sensitive as you want. You just add another monomer. They're digital in the sense that once we know the monomers and the chemistry of the uh, click coupling reagents, we can put all of those in a test tube in vitro and with copper catalysis create large quantities of these. So we're independent of living animals. And once you've got a really good reagent, it's in your computer. You'll never have to worry about uh, reproducing it. Um, the epitope direction voids cross-reactivity. We're now in the company learning how to scale up production so we can make these things more readily. So we think in vivo and in vitro diagnosis and, and the use of, I think the major use in the future could well be uh, the use of therapeutic reagents. And what really attracts me about this is maybe we can eliminate all of the off-site targets that are real killers for big protein molecules that, uh, that we all know about. And uh, I think it's going to replace monoclonal antibodies in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. So in the last four or five years, we've seen a real convergence to uh, P4 medicine, uh, systems biology and medicine, this uh, digital revolution of Fitbits and the like, uh, the um, uh, big data and its analytics, and finally, social networks. And uh, how does P4 medicine differ from contemporary medicine? It differs strikingly so. It's proactive rather than reactive. It's focused on an individual and not on populations. It's a major focus on wellness as well as disease, and not just disease. And it's all about generating these dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds to optimize wellness, avoid disease. And it argues that we should never again use big, large clinical trials and their appropriately selected controls for drug discovery. Because if you take 30,000 patients and give them drug or placebo, every one of those patients is different genetically and environmentally. And in averaging those individuals, you enormously enhance the noise. You suppress the signal. And big pharma has I mean, there are exceptions, but they've shown this over and over again. So what we'll do is we'll create 1,000 or 10,000 dense dynamic data clouds. And then, based on the properties of the individual, we can stratify according to the characteristics we're interested in. And let me just say, I think uh, social networks are going to be incredibly important for education and, and crowdsourcing and, I think, advocacy. I think the group that's really going to revolutionize healthcare in the future are going to be the patients that demand better care than they're getting now. And I think those patient groups are uh, starting to merge in interesting ways. So two themes in P4 medicine. One is wellness, and we'll be quantifying that, as I'll show you. And the other is uh, demystifying disease. And we know now that about 98% of society's resources go into disease. Almost nothing goes into wellness. And it's a little dubious in character. but. What I'm going to say is there will emerge a scientific wellness industry over the next 10 to 15 years. And I'll argue that will have an enormously greater market cap than the current disease industry or the current healthcare industry. There'll be a shift of funds toward uh, wellness in the future. 
And wellness actually is really the key to disease. So what wellness will do is one, let us optimize human potential. And I'll show you how we do that in a moment. Number two, if we follow individuals that are well and, and watch their transition to disease, if we have large numbers, we'll see transitions to all common diseases and learn how to identify them and begin creating the therapeutic reagents for instantaneous reversal back to wellness. And of course, what's uh, interesting from your point of view is these dense dynamic personalized data clouds can be used to follow disease, follow the response to therapy, and then if, if, uh, if lucky, follow the return to health and so forth. And I'll show you some examples of these things. So in 2014, we did create a pilot project of 108 of my friends who somewhat grudgingly admitted they'd, they'd submit to this dense dynamic data cloud business. And what we did basically was to do their genome sequence and then every three months do uh, bloods for uh, clinical chemistries, metabolites, proteins, highly selected proteins. Every three months, the gut microbiome, and then we did quantized data. And what we did then was to integrate all of these data together in such a way that we could identify actionable possibilities that allowed one either to improve their wellness or avoid disease. And I'm, if you're interested, I'd be glad to tell you how we arrived at the initial set of actionable possibilities, but it, they're growing enormously as we get more and more of this uh, kind of data. So uh, we, we, from the literature, were able to identify hundreds of actionable possibilities. We looked at the data on the individuals and applied them, and we've shown that, that uh, we can get uh, from the integration of two or more data types all sorts of new actionable possibilities. And the most important part of this study in many ways is we used coaches who could bring to the individuals the meaning of what an actionable possibility was and place it in the context of the individual's own healthcare objectives. We got a 70% compliance on actionable possibilities because of these uh, spectacular coaches. And uh, so, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you two kinds of data that uh, came out of this that are really spectacular. So let me say, I think the stents dynamic human data clouds are exactly like the Hubble telescope. What it's showing us for the first time is the dark matter of human biology that no one has ever been able to probe before. And I'll show you an example of where I think this is done. We've actually been able to care, compare individual data types for these five major data, data sets here with data types and all of the other major types and ask statistically which of these are correlated. And with some more recent corrections, we've moved it down from 35,000 correlations to about 15,000 correlations. But nonetheless, those correlations reveal new kinds of biology that are connected. They reveal new types of actionable possibilities that can be carried out. Uh, and they give us fundamental insights into the stratification of individuals in ways we never could have thought before. So we can cut much more finely populations. And you're all familiar with the fact in giving drugs to many different types of drugs to many different people, you're lucky if you get 10 to 15% of the people responders. We think with this kind of stratification, we'll be able to cut out responders uh, very, very quickly. So stratification is going to be a very, very important part of this. The other thing we can do is we can determine your genetic risk for about 60 diseases by using GWAS data, which itself uh, is, uh, has identified with it probabilities. So we can take a set of GWAS data for uh, cholesterol levels, and we can map both the negative and the positive uh, genetic factors into you and give you a single genetic risk score. And I'll give you an example of where we've done this for the five. We've been the 108 individuals into five categories from very low to very high here. 
And then we've correlated those individuals and their genetic risk against the disease phenotype, which is LDL cholesterol in this type. So the green uh, LDL cholesterol correlates perfectly with disease phenotype here. And the red indicates uh, the drop at the end indicates those people taking statins. So it kind of conforms what this is about. But it gives us the ability to separate the implications of genetic risk from the implications of actual disease. And that's really critically important for thinking about diagnostic markers uh, and, and new types of uh, therapy in the future. So, and we can obviously do this for all of the GWAS diseases. And there are now about 60 or 70 of them. And I've just colored in red uh, the various cancers that GWAS analyses have been uh, carried out on. So one thing one could think about doing is taking a population that's older, getting the high-risk individuals, and following these with dense dynamic data clouds to see their transitions into the various uh, types of tumors that you see here. So we've then shown you we can get correlations. We've shown you that we can uh, determine genetic risk and correlate that with disease phenotypes. We've done that uh, with five different diseases. And what I didn't talk about is we've looked at all sorts of different transitions, including the transition from well to greater wellness. And we have metrics now that are going to, in time, be the metrics for measuring wellness. And I think in time, separating the physiologic from the, the uh, sociologic uh, aspects of wellness. The pioneer insights, 50% were skeptical. They all came out really convinced it was a fascinating experience. And a lot of them loved the idea that they could take control of their own health with proper data. And I think this is the real key to savings in the future. Your genome doesn't control your destiny, just your potential. And we can't circumvent all the limitations of the genome, but we can circumvent most limitations of the genome if you know about them and are willing to make lifestyle and other kind of changes about them. We're all less well than we think. I mean, there were a few pioneers that were truly exceptional and extremely well. Even they had multiple actionable possibilities. But I'd say the vast bulk of people were way, way low on the wellness, wellness scale. And many of them went up a whole series of levels uh, across the course of this as they uh, adhered to the actionable possibilities. As I said, 70% were acted upon. And almost everyone wanted to continue with the next phase, which was creating a company that's a wellness-focused uh, consumer company that essentially is carrying out these kinds of studies now. And the reason we're excited about this is it's worked incredibly well in the first six months. We have way more than 1,000 individuals. And over the next couple of years, we'll be bringing in probably around 30,000 additional individuals. So this gives us an enormous amount of data to do things we'll talk, think about in the future. But it gives us the ability to optimize people's wellness in really absolutely fascinating ways. And ISB is going to be doing wellness projects in a variety of ways. And we'll, we'll talk about a couple of those in just a moment. So the, the last of the paradigm changes, of course, was bringing peak poor medicine to the healthcare system. And of course, this affiliation that I talked about uh, occurred on March 9th when we signed together an, an agreement. And of course, most of you know what Providence is. For, for me, what Providence is, it has a unique and marvelous leadership that is really excited about the kind of medicine I've been talking about. And I'll tell you, I went to eight or 10 classic academic clinical centers. And there were always people who were enthusiastic, but there were always people that were threatened. And it just doesn't work out where you've got all the silos and everything. So Providence is an ideal partner for us. Uh, uh, 3.2 million patients and their patient record. So it opens up really incredible possibilities. And what we propose to do starting from uh, uh, when we start, which is April 1st, uh, appropriate, uh, are these four translational pillars. So what, um, 
Providence is thinking seriously of doing, which will really be a transformational study in wellness, is to take 5,000 of its employees and put it through the Aerofail wellness study for a period of two to three years, and then do 5,000 age, sex, et cetera, matched controls over that period of time. And what will be exciting about that, of course, is, is the data we'll get. But we'll have the economic proof that wellness is really going to save healthcare systems an enormous amount of money. And if you were really a smart healthcare system, you'd become a payer so you could benefit in those enormous savings. And I'm talking with Rod Hockman about thinking about that as a, as a possibility. A second project we're really fascinated with is with Tom Brown here taking some 200 women who have been through the rigors of, of breast cancer therapy and over a period of two th or three years bringing them back to normal wellness, correcting all the brutal things that radiation, chemotherapy, and, and surgery have done to them. So I think this is going to be a very exciting project. We're, we're going to do a project on Alzheimer's disease, and I'll be glad to talk about what that is all about. But I think one of the really moonshot ideas that we're excited about is glioblastoma. I'll say half of my faculty of, of nine work on glioblastoma. And there, is, as you heard uh, from Charles, is enormous complementarity here. You'll hear it later from Nit and Beliga on this. But I think we can put together, I'll, I'll tell you what my real ambition is to put together a moonshot on glioblastoma that in five years will make it a chronic disease like AIDS is. And let me just tell you, my bias in cancer is you're never going to cure it unless you start with triple drug therapy from day one. And we have really great ideas with Charles on how to do that kind of thing. But we then in 10 years would like to have it be a cured disease. And I think with the kind of approaches that you've seen here, we have at least a, a shot at that enormous ambition. Providence is also going to support an incredible technology platform that I won't talk about. But we're negotiating with a DNA sequencing company the possibility of setting up very large scale DNA sequencing uh, in another year and a half at $200 a genome and being able to do enough so you could easily handle the input of patients and, and considerably more. So we, we're really thinking seriously of becoming a very large scale uh, genome center. So in closing, my vision is we want to bring P4 medicine to and its systems approaches to the healthcare system. Health is both about assessing your genetics and your environmental exposures. And the best way to do that is through these dense, dynamic, personalized data clouds. And wellness is going to do three things. One, it's going to let us optimize human potential by maximizing wellness. It's going to allow us to study the very earliest transitions of all the common diseases and learn how to revert them back immediately. And three, it's going to allow us to study the course of the disease and just follow it all the way through its progression, its response to therapy, and, and if and when uh, return to wellness. I'll just say that once we have 10,000 or so of these dense dynamic data clouds, it is utterly going to transform how pharma, biotech companies, uh, nutrition companies, diagnostic companies function because we can, in these data, enormously reduce the signal to noise problems that they run into all the time. And I think what's uh, equally exciting is the possibility that the uh, commercialization of scientific wellness, I think in time with lower prices on the assays, will lead to a digitalization of medicine, uh, will reduce the cost, and will be able to bring it to the poor as well as to the rich. And I think this will lead to a democratization of healthcare that was really inconceivable to think about not too long ago. And I think scientific wellness is really going to be, begin to let us deal in very interesting ways with aging and end of cost life. And if anyone's interested, I'll tell you about that. But I think I probably should quit so we can, uh, we can go on.